Hey friend, welcome to the broadcast today. Listen, if you have a Bible, grab it. If you're just about ready to eat dinner, let it get cold. What you're gonna hear in the next 30 minutes is more important than you having a physical meal right now. Sit down and feed your spirit. You're gonna hear something that is going to help you. You know, Job said, God, I've esteemed your word more than my necessary bread. If you give God's word its rightful place in your heart, things will happen in your life, friends. Let's get into the word of God together. Romans chapter 9, and we're going to begin in verse 21. Romans 9 and 21. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. In the verses we read, there's four vessels mentioned. A vessel of honor, a vessel of dishonor, a vessel of wrath, and a vessel of mercy. As we read it, you know, it may not mean a lot to us, but to the hearers that received this letter of Romans initially, they understood some of the analogy that the Apostle Paul was making when he mentioned these four vessels. Every hearer was familiar with what a vessel of honor was. They knew what a vessel of dishonor was. They understood what a vessel of wrath was. They knew what a vessel of mercy was. And we're going to talk about those four vessels today. And of course, they all represent people and different aspects of life that people embody. And we're going to deal with these one at a time, beginning with a vessel of honor. It's also mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And if you would, just turn there with me quickly. We want to read about it there. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 20. It says, but in a great house... There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And I think we can see right away that a vessel of honor has to do with being set apart. That's what sanctified means. Set apart and useful for God. Prepared for every good work. You see, vessels of honor work. They're engaged in good works. They're used by God. And God is working in us by His Word and by His Spirit to make us into vessels of honor. Now, the vessel of honor was probably the most purchased vessel in the potter's yard. It held about five gallons of fresh water, had two handles attached to the neck, and it sat on a, a bench that was about three feet high that had three holes in it. One for the vessel of honor, one for the vessel of dishonor, and one for a small drinking vessel. And the vessel of honor was found just inside of the temple where people would use it to wash their hands before they would go into pray. It was also found just outside of the home where travelers that had been walking on the dusty roads with their sandals could have their feet washed before they entered the home. But more than anything else, the vessel of honor was just used to quench people's thirst. And it's significant to us where it was found in the temple and in the home. You see, our first place of service should be in our homes. You know, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and he said, I've left you an example. You need to wash one another's feet. You need to serve one another. And we should be vessels of honor serving our husbands or wife or children or, or parents or whoever's in the home. We should be pouring out to help them on their journey with God or on their journey to God, helping to you know, quench and satisfy their thirst. We should be pouring out in the home. And by that, you know, you might think, well, you're talking about, you know, like family Bible reading? Well, I, I guess so. You know, praying together as a family, sure, that's important. But 
I'm not talking about, you know, creating some hyper-spiritual boot camp where the kids are forced to sit in a boring Bible study for an hour before they're allowed to go out and play every day. You know, we, we read the Bible in our home. We prayed together. We talked a lot about God, but it was always easy and natural, and it was never forced. You know, there was just a natural grace about it. More than anything else, though it, it may include, you know, reading the Bible as a family or, or praying together, those things are important, but more than anything else, pouring out and being a vessel of honor in your family and in your home just means spending time with your family. They just need time more than anything else. And I shared the story about a particular minister that got in trouble financially. They, the ministry had done some things that were unethical and illegal and he actually ended up going to court and being sentenced to a, a term in a minimum security prison. And so he was in the prison and his son would visit him with a chaperone often. And then I believe it was his son's 16th birthday. He was allowed to go into that minimum security facility without a chaperone. And he spent the whole day with his dad on his birthday. At the end of the day when he's getting ready to leave, he said, Dad, this has been the greatest day of my life. His dad said, what? I mean, you spent a day with me in the prison yard. How can this be the greatest day of your life? And he said, Dad, my whole life, all I ever wanted was just one whole day with you. But you never had time. I understand you were busy with ministry and, and all had all these other people in your life all the time. All I ever wanted was just one day with you. It's been the greatest day of my life, Dad. And this is what that father said. He said, I had to go to prison to give my boy a day of my life. You know, Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 6 said, They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Remember I read a story about a pastor from a small country church, a very tiny congregation, and when people wanted to visit, they just put a note in the offering container when it came by. pastor was going through the few notes that came in that Sunday, and there was one that said, I'm your most devoted member. I'm your most generous member. And I'm dying of loneliness. It was signed by his wife. <sighs> we need to spend time with our families. You know, with our schedules, you know, it's a bit unique. Um, we've had for probably 20 years Saturday night services, as well as, you know, all the services on Sunday. And we didn't do that to give people, you know, an option. It's, it's always been out of necessity. We used to have seven services at our last location, two Saturday night and five on Sunday. And so, you know, the kids all through the school year, um, I can't spend a weekend with them unless I take the weekend off, when they have off. And I've got to pull, pull away, you know, in the middle of the day Saturday to start getting my heart ready for services. And so it was unique for us. And so what I did is I pulled our kids out of school fairly often. And I'd pull one of them out and said, you got daddy for the whole day, whatever you want to do. You want to go to the movies, you want to go shopping, you want to go to the beach, whatever you want to do, I'm yours for the whole day. And I did that periodically with all the kids growing up. I remember one day I'd taken Spencer and we'd hung around all day and ended up at the beach and we'd been goofing around in the water and kind of watching the sunset. We're laying on our towels and I go, Spence, what's your favorite thing to do? He goes, hanging out with you, Dad. I just, oh. <laughs> But you know, spending time with them is incredibly, incredibly important. Now, if you have done poorly in that area, maybe kids are grown and gone and, and you look back and you realize all of these lost opportunities, hey, don't underestimate the power of prayer and the grace of God. Your kids may be up and gone and you miss their childhood, you miss their growing up and you look back and think, if I'd only know, maybe you just followed the pattern of your own father or of your own mother. And you just repeated the kind of parenthood that was displayed to you and you didn't know any better. Well, you know what? You, you can't recapture that. Some of those opportunities are gone, but prayer changes things, my friend. And the grace of God is truly amazing and He can reach out and grab your family members wherever they are on planet Earth and He can do great things in your life. God is a restorer of lost things, so don't you lose hope. But friend, if your family is still there, 
Do not sacrifice them on the altar of your career. It is not worth it. You're not going to lay on your deathbed and wish you'd spent more time at the office. No, you won't. Make your family a priority. Pour out to them. And the second place we'd find that vessel of honor is in the temple or in the church. Pouring out and serving others. Volunteering, praying, giving. Listen to these verses from Galatians 6, verse 9 and 10. Just listen to them. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we'll reap if we don't lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we have opportunity. Let's do good. You know, there was a, an aqueduct the Romans built over 1,900 years ago that went into Segovia, Spain. And it provided clear, pure water for people for almost 2,000 years. And they decided one day, this is a national treasure. We need to protect this thing. So they diverted the water and made a modern aqueduct just so that they could preserve it. But you know what happened? Within about two years, all the mortar dried out between the stones and it began to crumble and fall apart. For over 1,900 years, it had been vital and strong as long as it served. But the moment it stopped serving, it dried out and became brittle. And if you want to keep your, your vitality and your spiritual strength, you need to begin to pour out in service to others. Be a vessel of honor pouring out, you know, in God's house. Whether it's, it's praying or encouraging or volunteering in some way, you, you can't just take in and take in and take in. There comes a point that you need to pour out and do good to others, especially, the Scripture says, to those of the household of faith. And truly, it is an honor, a, a, a high honor, to serve God's people in God's house. The psalmist said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Even just shaking somebody's hand and greeting them when they come in the building or working with a kid or working a camera or being on the prayer team or whatever it is, it is a high honor to do that. And that's one of the places that the vessel of honor would pour out. And then mentioned here as well is the vessel of dishonor. We find it, and I read again from 2 Timothy 2 and 20. But in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. And the vessel of dishonor looked much like the vessel of honor. It also held about five gallons, had two handles at the neck. But when it came out of the fire of the kiln, the potter saw that it was flawed. Something had gone wrong with it. There was pock marks on it or something else. And so they would sell them regularly in the potter's yard at a reduced rate. And people bought them quite often. And it was found on that water bench next to the vessel of honor, but the dirty water was poured into it. He also found it in the home. It was the rubbish bin. It was the Judean garbage can. The scraps were thrown into it. The garbage was thrown into it. And friend, it's not God's will that any of us be a vessel of dishonor. That's not his plan for a single one of us. In fact, look again in verse 21. Therefore, if anyone, say anyone, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, we can be vessels of honor, something that we have to determine ourselves to do. And when he speaks about the latter, he's referring to the things he's mentioned previously in the chapter. And there's a number of thoughts that could apply, but the most predominant thought carried throughout the chapter to this point has to do with words. Look back in verse 14 with me, if you would. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like a cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Gossip, idle talk, and harmful doctrine. They repeat stories 
about people that they hear. They sow discord and they hold to doctrines that undermine the fundamental beliefs of the church to which they belong. I remember going to another Bible study as a young Christian, and it was sort of the hippie Bible study. It wasn't connected to a church, though people from a couple different churches came. And there was a young lady that had, you know, just moved into town, single mom, and she was a Christian, and she came, and she was, she was very, very attractive. And I really think the root of it, some of the other gals there were jealous of her, and so they started talking. And there was one of the studies she didn't come to, and they spent the whole time talking about this lady. Oh, I've heard that she leaves her boy alone all day. I don't know if she's a fit mother at all. I don't even know if she's a Christian. Doesn't seem to me that a Christian would do something like that. And just, just talking about her and talking about her. By the time they were done, she seemed like the wicked witch of the West. <laughs> I was so uncomfortable there. And you know what? She heard what they'd done and it, and it caused people to treat her differently. She was shattered. Ended up never coming back to church again, at least in that town after that. Do you know there's a very short list of things that God hates? You can read it in Proverbs 6. It says there's six things that God hates. One of them is he that sows discord among brethren. It doesn't say God is just displeased with it. God hates that. And the word sows, in other words, just, just words, just seeds, little innuendos, little things that will, you know, darken someone's thought about another person. God hates it. I realize that all of us in our flesh have propensities toward certain sins. The Bible uses the word iniquity for that. The word iniquity, the Hebrew word, actually comes from a, a word that means to bend. It means like a, a bent or a crook in a tree. And all of us in our flesh, one day we're going to get a new body, thank God forever. But in the meantime, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, and all of us in our flesh, there's a certain bent in our flesh toward certain sins. Some people, they have a bent toward gossip. Other people, it's not too hard. But for those that have that bent that way, listen, it, it doesn't let you off the hook. You still need to deal with it. If you don't have something constructive to say, do yourself and everyone else a favor, shut up. Don't be a vessel of dishonor. Cleanse yourself from that and become a vessel of honor. Because you know what? If you don't deal with the, with the garbage, if you don't cleanse it, and the garbage keeps piling up, you know what happens? It draws flies. You know one of the, one of the designations for Satan in the Bible? You find it in Mark chapter 3. He's called Beelzebub. That literally means Lord of the flies. Lord of the dung heap. And you put that thought together with this, and I think if we, we gossip and slander and we don't deal with it, we leave an open door for the devil to come into our life. And I think some people, they've got this demonically inspired bitterness, demonically inspired oppression, or demonically inspired hatred, or sometimes even a demonically enforced sickness. And the open door to it was they wouldn't control their tongue. Get a hold of it. Be a vessel of honor. Repent if you need to. If you need to go tell someone you're sorry, do so. And uh, get a hold of that little red rebel behind your teeth and hold him in check. All right, third vessel mentioned was the vessel of, or that we're going to deal with is the vessel of mercy. We read about it in Romans 9, 23. And it actually looked identical to the vessel of honor, but it wasn't destined for the water bench outside of the the temple, or just inside the temple, or outside of the home, the vessel of mercy was taken to the city center. It was set out so that strangers could find a drink of water. People would put it in the city square. They would sit on, you know, on fences and on windowsills so that in that arid land, if a stranger was coming through, they were always guaranteed to find a drink of water. And the significance to us is, hey, we need to take mercy out to where it is needed Jesus said, go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And there's people around us all the time that need mercy. 
You know, only the guilty need mercy. I was talking to a friend just two days ago. He was in a restaurant, and the waitress was just giving him terrible service. And you know how frustrating that can be. And the first response is to not leave a nice tip. <laughs> you know, the, the, the word tip, T-I-P, stands for to ensure promptness. That's what tip stands for. You know, tip needs to be earned. But I have made my living as a waiter, and I know what it can be like. In fact, the restaurant that I was a waiter in, if there were Christians sitting at a table and everybody knew, everybody fought not to wait on that table because Christians were the worst tippers. They'd leave tracks and no money. They said, don't go into the restaurant today and talk about how good church was and, you know, God this and God that. Leave a huge tip if you talk about Jesus. Now, maybe that's just my ex-waiter coming out, but it's, it's important. Anyway, this girl's giving terrible service, and the guy's thinking about giving her a piece of his mind, but he felt restrained, like the Holy Spirit says, don't open your mouth. A few minutes later, she came up, she said, I'm so sorry, I realize I'm giving you just terrible service. She says, I just got a phone call that one of my closest friends died, and I'm just numb. I'm so sorry. Well, there's a great opportunity to show mercy. And you know, there's people all around us that are going through stuff like that. You know, the place where you work, where you buy your groceries, in your neighborhood. And vessels of mercy, they don't go and, and thunder out damnation and judgment. They pour out mercy. And most people just need to be loved. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Let's be vessels of mercy. And then the last vessel we spoke about, or that we read about there in Romans chapter 9, was the vessel of wrath. And actually the potter had in the ancient world a very interesting method for repairing a cracked vessel. I read about it in a book years ago. He would go through the fields in the afternoon searching for a little tick-like insect that was called a fasuka. They would engorge themselves on the blood of bulls and goats, and when they got full, just like a when a tick does, it would let go, and they would get them, and he'd take them back to his shop and put them in a little clay vessel and leave them there until he went to work later on. And if he had a vessel that was cracked, he would take those insects and squash them and mix that blood, the blood of bulls and goats, mix it with a dry clay powder. It formed a little glue-like substance, and he'd work it into the crack and then put it back in the fire of the kiln, and when it came out, it was a restored vessel. Now, if it didn't work, repeat the process. But if for some reason the potter's only remedy of fixing that broken vessel didn't work, it became a vessel of wrath. Now, it wasn't that the blood had failed. It was that the vessel had refused the blood. You know, in a sense, all human beings are like those broken vessels. We've all sinned and we've all become broken inwardly before God, and God does have a remedy to fix us, and it's better than the blood of bulls and goats. It's the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 5 and 9 says, Much more than, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. But if a person refuses the gift of God's Son and refuses what his blood can do, they've sealed their fate, the wrath of the potter. And even though it was much to his dislike, that vessel that refused to be repaired was taken to a section of wall, city of Jerusalem, overlooking the potter's field, and it was cast down into an area that actually burned with refuse 24 hours a day, lost forever. But you know what? We don't have to experience the wrath of God. The good news is God sent His own Son, Jesus Christ. And the wrath of God was poured out on Him for sins that He didn't commit. We were the guilty ones. Jesus took our place. He took our punishment for our sins on Calvary's cross. And His blood, blood my friend, washes us clean from every sin. On the third day, He was raised from the dead. And the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We are saved from the wrath when we accept the work of His precious blood. I want you to consider what we've talked about. First, being a vessel of honor. 
maybe you have neglected ministry to your own family. And again, I'm not talking about some hyper-spiritual boot camp, you know, that you turn your home into where the children just can't wait to stay away. But just this easy and graceful and non-forced atmosphere of love and, hey, I'm here. And again, if you've made a mess of that and opportunity's gone, God answers prayers. And the grace of God can reach around the world. And also those vessels of honor pour out in the household of faith. And if you've been taken in and taken in, find an outlet, find a place to give out what you've been taken in. You're blessed to be a blessing. If you've been a vessel of dishonor, if you've been the kind of person that can sit in the kitchen and lick a spoon in the living room, you've got a long tongue. <laughs> Deal with it. Like I said, it's on the short list of things that God says he hates. Don't be a sower of discord. In fact, if somebody comes up to you, wants to share a juicy story, you grab their hands and say, let's pray for that person. Because you will find that you will never gossip about people that you pray for. But contrary, you'll never pray for people you gossip about. Don't be a gossip. And I think God wants us all to be vessels of mercy. There's some people in your world that you interact with that need some mercy, need some kindness, need some encouragement. May you be God's vessel. May your heart whisper, God, send me. God, use me. And the good news of the gospel is none of us need be a vessel of wrath. You know, I, I think like most people, want to be that vessel that is used by God, a vessel that brings honor to Him. But the truth is we are all on a journey. Uh, there's no finishing point. God is always working in our life. So I want to encourage you to be encouraged. I want to encourage you to not quit. I want to encourage you to keep on with God. God knew what He was doing when He called you. He knew what He was doing when He laid His hand upon you. And some of you may be in that place where you've been waiting and waiting, God, when are these dreams going to come to pass? The thing you put in my heart, when God, when God, when God. Friend, God is never, ever late. And sometimes that eternal work that goes on in us while we're growing as we wait is so valuable. It equips us and makes us ready for that service that we are to render to God. So I pray that you are encouraged in Jesus' name. And hey, go tell somebody about your Savior today. We hope to see you next week. God bless.